Okay, I just caught myself. I made a very big mistake that could have possibly ruined this engine. What's going on fellow Scrapaholics? Welcome back to another episode here at The Stable. In the last video, we got our engine block prepped and ready to start our rebuild, where we also set all of our piston ring gaps, and we also gave all of the cylinders a nice hone in order for the piston rings to adjust to their new home. But before we continue, we have some packages to unbox two packages more specifically, and I'm very intrigued on why both of these say do not ship by air. There's only one way to find out. Oh, sick. Oh my God. Yes, yes, yes. Up to 75 pounds. <laughs> Look at all these magnets. That is a huge help. You guys know we struggle with the magnets here quite a bit. This package didn't come with the note, but thank you to whoever sent these over. Oh, uh-oh. I've scratched the paint. Huge thanks to the person who sent over those magnets. Now let's get to work. As you guys know from the other videos, I was not looking forward to having to rebuild this engine. And to be completely honest with you guys, I wasn't looking forward to it because I was a little bit intimidated. Not so much intimidated by the assembly and the actual labor of doing it, but intimidated by the fact that we don't have all the fancy tools that are typically used when rebuilding an engine. And also intimidated by the prices that the machine shop would charge us. But with a budget of basically zero, just snapped into my head. Head. let's just put this thing back together as is let's see what happens and with that change of mentality just like that i am super excited to put this engine back together yes 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 crank might be bent out of round cylinders might be out of round there could be something wrong with the pistons and the rods some of you might actually want to see this thing blow up but anyway like i've said before this block has already been bored 40 over I wouldn't even want to take it to a machine shop to have them bore it, say, 60 over. I would say this block is on its way out anyway, if it makes it long enough. And if we have the budget later on, we'll even throw some boost at it. Then we could send a rod into orbit. Once again, these main bearings weren't bad. It was mainly the thrust bearing that had the most signs of wear, which is pretty normal for the thrust bearing to have the most wear out of all of them. Some of you made a really good point in I should clean the cylinders once again to make sure we get all of the honing grit out of the cylinder walls. I had sprayed it with some brake cleaner and then wiped it off with a microfiber but I'm going to clean it once again just to be sure. I'm gonna spray them again with some brake cleaner just to get the oil that we put on there. It was recommended I use warm soapy water but uh, here at the shop we only have cold soapy water so I'm gonna use the soft end of a sponge and some dish soap and I'm trying to keep the water and the soap just inside the cylinder walls. I don't want to get it anywhere else so I don't have to worry about rust anywhere else. But now I'm gonna use some brake cleaner to get rid of the soap that we might have left. Now with the clean microfiber, I'm gonna do everything once again. Let's see how clean or dirty the cylinders are. Clean towel, still relatively clean, pretty clean, still clean. Now that we are squeaky clean, I'm once again going to lather up the cylinder walls in oil. We're gonna start off the block assembly with the heart of the engine which is the crank. To start off, we have to make sure all of our bearing surfaces are clean before we install them and lint free. Now that these are clean, we can go grab our bearings. No, this rag is not to protect the Mustang, it's to protect the bearings from the Mustang. Anyway, these are our main cap bearings. These are a 10 undersized bearing with a half groove. So half groove just means that one side of the bearing gets this groove on it while the other side is flat. You can see the 10 right there signifying it's a 10 undersize. And they are labeled so you kind of can't mess up here. This one's the lower one. So, I mean, there's only another half. This one is the upper one. All right, let's get these installed. For the installation of the bearings, it's pretty hard to mess up. There's this little indentation right here and only one side of the bearing has that indentation right here. So you can't really put it on the wrong way. Just pop it in and she's good to go. This is what it looks like under the bearing. So you can get a better idea there. Right here, you can see the passages do line up. So this is where the crank is going to get its oil from. And now we just pop the rest of them on. While I'm putting them on, I'm making sure that there's no, uh, there's no lint or debris where these have to sit because that will make a difference. Some people will argue that we have to put oil under these. Um, some people will say we don't. I'm not gonna do it just because I don't see why. All right, so all of our top bearings are now installed. That wasn't that hard, was it? 
Um, as you can see, we have the half groove on this side. So let's keep going. So now the next step is a very important step. And that is that we have to check our bearing clearances. So how do we check bearing clearances without having special equipment that is hundreds of dollars? We use this little thing called plastic gauge. Before I get any further, I should explain what bearing clearance really is for those of you that don't know. So we have our crank and then we have the bearing that we installed under here and over it will be another bearing, the other half of the bearing with the main cap um, squishing it right here. So we are measuring the gap between the bearing surface and the crank while everything is torqued down. And this measurement is going to tell us how much room the oil has to travel around the crank surface and the bearing surface. Contrary to popular belief, the crank is not supposed to actually ride on the metal or on the bearing. There's supposed to be a super thin film of oil between this surface right here and the surface of the actual bearing. So that bearing gap is important not only on the main bearings, but also the rod bearings. If the gap is too big or too loose, you will probably won't have any oil pressure and you'll probably have some rattling or knocking. But if this gap is too tight, you'll also run into some issues like not having enough oil in between the journal and the bearing. So that is why those measurements are so important. And the most accurate way to measure those clearances is with a micrometer and a bore gauge. But those are worth a couple hundred dollars and not in the average Joe's toolbox. So again, that's where the plastic gauge comes in. And this stuff is stupidly simple to use. All it is is this thin strand of plastic that you see right here. You simply just cut off a piece and lose it on the floor. You simply just cut off a little piece and you definitely don't want to stretch this so you don't want to pull it out of the packaging. You want to cut the length of it to roughly the size of or the length of the journal that you're measuring. Then we're going to grab our main cap and install the new bearing. Make sure it's seated properly and it's not dirty, no lint, no nothing. Then we're going to throw on our main cap with that little strand in there. And once this main cap is torqued to spec, the tiny strand of plastic gauge in there will spread and get squished. And the packaging itself is the measuring tool. So depending on how much it spreads and gets squished, it'll tell you what the measurement is. I might as well do all of them at the same time. So I'm just going to prep all these main caps. I also didn't add any assembly lube or oil to the journals yet because that could alter our measurements. Lightly place it on there, easy peasy. Repeat the steps for these. So all of our main bearings now have a little piece of plastic gauge resting on the journals. Now we're gonna add the main caps, making sure that we don't knock over the, the plastic gauge. I'm also not going to spin the crankshaft at all because there is no oil or assembly lube to protect it. I'm also lightly tapping the main caps in order for them to seat all the way properly. Now we can start torquing them down with the proper sequence. These are supposed to be torqued to 60 to 70 foot pounds. We're gonna start at 30, then 50, and then move to 65. Now we're moving up to 50. And thank you to the supporter who sent us this torque wrench because we needed it more than I knew we would. Actually, we'll take it up all the way to 70. All right, all of the main caps are now torqued to spec. The plastic gauge should be squished enough for us to get a proper reading. All right, now we can undo everything and check the clearances. Starting with the number one main cap. As you can see, we have a really good imprint right there of the squished plastic gauge, as well as on the main cap we just removed. It's pretty faint on camera, but you can get an idea here. So now what? Now we get our packaging right here. And as you can see, it reads from one thousandth of an inch all the way to three thousandths of an inch. So we match it up with what fits best. And I feel like it doesn't fit well with two thousandths. It does fit really well with 15. And it's too small to be this one. So that's reading right at 15. So for this engine, we wanna be anywhere from 15 thousandths to two thousandths of an inch. And again, we're sitting right at 15 for this first main bearing. So first bearing is good, but now we have uh, four more that we have to check. Let's continue with the number two bearing. So it's in between 15 thousandths and two thousandths. So I'm gonna assume it's probably somewhere within the 17 thousandths. Two is good, let's move on to three. We are right about two thousandths. The outline is too small for it to fit in the 15 thousandths mark. 
I would say 2000s is right where we're at. Third main cap, good. Let's check the fourth. Okay, there's the plastic gauge on the number four bearing. So you can see it's just too, too small to fit in that 15,000s box. But if it's just right in that 2000s box, last but not least, too small for the 15 and it fits right in the 2000s. Nice. Cool beans. All of our main bearings are with intolerance. So that's really good. To be honest, I was already expecting the worst. So it's good news that at least that is good. And we could just clean off the plastic gauge with some parts cleaner or brake cleaner, whatever you want to use. And now we can start the actual assembly. And to start off, we're gonna use some assembly lube to protect everything on the first start. And you don't wanna be stingy with the lube, but you also don't wanna clog up any of the oil passages because this stuff is very sticky and very thick. Forgot to mention, I'm using Permatex Ultra Slick Assembly Lube. And one of these bottles will last you a couple engines because I used this one on our last uh, 289 rebuild and yet I still have some. For the thrust bearing, it is important not only that we get the lube on the surface right here, but also on the sides, because that is where that thrust um, bearing comes into play. Now we can drop in the actual crank once again. This thing is so damn heavy. Now that we got that taken care of, this is a perfect time to install our rear main seal. This engine takes a one piece rear main seal. I know a lot of older 302s or 289s, any small block, take a two piece rear main seal. I also put a very light coat of RTV on the outside of the rear main to help it seal. And it's pretty easy right now because the crank isn't even bolted down. We're gonna pop it in until it's flush. Then we're also going to add a very thin layer on the outside corner right here. I'm going to put the rear main cap on now just because uh, the RTV is setting. Okay, now we can install the rest of the caps. All right, so all of our main caps are now in. Now I'm just going to start tightening them slowly. This isn't torque spec or anything. I'm just getting them a little bit more than hand tight. So at this point, we want to set our thrust bearing. And what that means is, I'll use the old ones as an example. So we want our bearings to be exactly flush on the same plane. So if I were to get a flat surface and put these both together, they would be, okay, my hand isn't flat, but you get the point. They need to be exactly in the same location. Um, so we need to set it so one isn't too far off to the right or one isn't too far off to the left. The way we do that is with brute force. This might not feel right, but this is the way everyone says to do it. We're going to hit it forward a little bit, then hit it backwards a little bit. Then hit it forwards again. And that should be set. So now we can start our torque sequence once again starting with 25 foot-pounds. 25 done, we're moving to 50. 50 done, we'll move to 70. All right. All right, so crank has now fully been installed. It rotates pretty nicely. Now we have to move on to these guys. The good thing is that we already set ourselves up to be as efficient as we can here. We already got all of the ring end gaps set with our cylinder number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wait, no with our one through eight cylinders. So now we D-ring and re-ring these pistons. And for those of you wondering why we're reusing the old pistons instead of just buying new ones, if I have to say the word budget one more time, I might freak out. So to start, I'm just going to disassemble it the most that I can so I can clean up the piston and then reassemble it back together. I'm sure there's a million ways to clean a piston, but we're just gonna make it simple. So with a now 
kind of clean piston we can open up our rod bearings so looking at the rod bearings left me a little bit concerned because every single one of them has an oil passage hole whereas the ones that were on there do not have any hole nor does the rod or the cap but from the little bit of research i've done it seems that ford discontinued uh these oil passages somewhere along in the 60s but my main concern was is it okay to run these bearings with the holes with this setup where it doesn't seem necessary to even have the holes but it seems that ford would even mix and match these somewhere in the 60s where they were building the 289s where they would send some 289s with oil holes and some without oil holes but well, we are going to use them anyway so same thing as the main cap bearings these just pop on follow the little groove right here and we should be set so this being our number one piston we have to install the piston rings in this number one row so with our number one piston cleaned and with new rod bearings obviously the top is still dirty i'm not i don't really feel like taking a wire brush to it starting off with the expander ring so just going ahead and slip it on then we're slipping the retaining ring onto the bottom of this uh oil ring and then another one on top of it and it moves freely that's exactly what we want every single one of these rings has an orientation so that means that wherever the end is wherever the two butts meet they have to be clocked in a specific location we'll get into that in a sec we'll just install all of them first next up we have the second ring and this one is side specific so there is a top and the bottom usually they'll have a mark or something this one says top right here but for these i'm going to use an actual piston ring installer tool because uh piston rings are sharp ask me how i know with the top saying top easy peasy now the top ring is not side specific in this case but some of them are so if you're doing this i'd watch out for that all right all of our new rings are now installed so with our piston number one having all the rings installed we can now get into how we're going to orientate them so this circle is going to be our piston let's say the front of our engine is over here our top ring which is the one closest to our cylinder head is going to be at our 12 o'clock position top ring our second ring which is the one in the second groove is going to be in our six o'clock position ignore ignore that our oil ring gap would be anywhere from 2 to 11 o'clock. And then the oil ring retaining rails, which are these thin ones right here, is going to be facing here, while the bottom one is going to be facing here. I know this is a pretty rough diagram, but let's go over it again. So our top ring, being this one right here, is going to be at our 12 o'clock position. Our second ring is going to be at our 6 o'clock position. And this groovy, groovy one is going to be anywhere from 11 to 2 o'clock. And the retaining rings themselves, top one is going to be around the 4 to 5 o'clock position. And the bottom one is going to be around the 7 to 8 o'clock position. So let's actually clock them correctly on our piston. So we have the front of the piston facing that way. Our top ring is going to be at our 12 o'clock position right here. Our bottom ring is going to be at our six o'clock position right here. And for our oil retaining ring, you can see where our gap is right here, where it's split. It is actually 180 degrees off. So we're gonna grab a pick and swing it over the top oil retaining ring. We can rotate it that way. So all of our rings have now been properly orientated. I know that was a bit confusing. I hope I explained it well, but now we have to repeat that process for the other seven pistons. All right, so we have our guide here for the piston rings. Let's get started. Three, two, one. There we go. All right, all of the pistons have now been dressed in all their rings and they are properly oriented. Now we can start throwing them into the block. Starting with cylinder number one, 
First thing I want to do is spin the crank so the journal is the furthest away it can be. There's pretty much only two things we're going to be using here. It's one of these piston installer tools and this thing just squeezes the piston rings so it'll be flush and it'll be easier to install. Second is we're going to be using some rubber hose and we're just going to throw these on the studs of the rod. That is so when we drop it into the cylinder we don't nick the crankshaft. So before we put in the piston I'm going to also drench it in some oil make sure all the rings are coated and the sleeves are nice and and slick while making sure i don't spin the rings out of their proper orientation also going to throw some oil in the wrist pin and this is a good time to make sure all of our piston rings are still in the right orientation and these are so All right, that is definitely squeezed. Also going to put a little bit of oil around the edges just to help it go down. All right, so we're just gonna make sure the tool itself is centered. I have just a tiny bit of the skirt inside the cylinders. So using a dead blow. Okay. I've hit a hard stop there. I can see one of the oil rings coming out. So right here, you can see where that oil ring was coming out. And instead of just forcing it down um, and possibly breaking it, we're just gonna start all over again. All right, she's in. So the number one piston is now in. You can see the rubber hoses here. Now we're going to push down on the piston till it meets this journal. I also forgot to add some assembly lube to the rod bearings. So that's what I'm doing now. Cool beans. So our piston is now sitting comfortably in its home. Now we reintroduce our friend plastic gauge. Unlike the main bearings, we're gonna have to do these one by one. I'm not going to put any assembly lube on this side yet. The rod bolts have a torque spec of about 20 to 25 foot pounds. So I'm gonna torque them to 10 first and then we'll take them up from there. All right, that's 10. Let's move up to 24 foot pounds. Okay, now let's undo and then check our plastic gauge. All right, there's our mark. So we wanna be somewhere right around where the crank was. It looks too small to fit into the 15 thousandths box, but too big to fit into the 2 thousandths box. So I'm going to assume it's around 17 thousandths, which is within spec. Just a little bit of assembly lube and back on she goes. I am going to torque it down to spec now because if I find an issue where the crank is binding or something isn't spinning right, I know it has something to do with what I just torqued. All right, the crank is still spinning pretty nice. Since our number two piston is next, I'm going to place the crank journal the furthest away from the top. Next up, piston numero dos. All right, let's see what our good friend Plasti Gauge has to say. It's gone. All right. 25 foot pounds. It reads 15. Okay, I'll take it. So what happens if that measurement is not what we want it to be? Well, one, you could take it to the machine shop and have them regrind and line hone the crank. Or two, you can play around with the bearing sizes and mix and match um, the top with the bottom bearings to get the clearance that you're looking for. In our case, if any of those bearing measurements were off or out of tolerance, um, we'd just cross our fingers and uh, hope for the best. Obviously, if this was a customer's car, it'd be a totally different story, but it's my engine and it's probably on its last legs already, so why not? <gasps> I really need to take this thing out from under here. I dropped the freaking rod bearing in here. Now this needs to be extra, extra cleaned. But like I was saying, we haven't, we haven't had any reason to worry yet. So let's just keep going.
You hear those jets? That's every day around here. I have received some comments that are like, there's only one way to build an engine and that's the right way. Although I do agree that there is some better ways to go about this that will ensure the longevity and uh, durability of the engine. I want to actually drive my car and if I have to wait six to eight months to be able to afford the work that the machine shop will do, I'd rather just run this one to the ground and then pull another one out of the junkyard and do it all over again. But that's just me. People are going to have different opinions. That's fine. Let's see what Mr. Plastic H has to say. Who knows, one day we'll build a fully machined block with forged internals. But for now, we got this budget build and it measures in right at two thousands. Lubrication is of course important. Ask any mechanic or machinist or wife. Glass half full or glass half empty. Either way, we have four more pistons to install and we're running out of daylight, so let's get to it. Okay, I just caught myself. I made a very big mistake that could have possibly ruined this engine. As we said before, with every piston and rod we install, we're gonna spin the engine to see if there's anything funny going on. And I just installed cylinder number six and I gave it the spin check and there's a very hard spot right here. It does not wanna spin freely. I knew right away to stop and to check everything once again. And what do you know, I installed the piston and the rod backwards. I can tell because all of the rods and the caps have their corresponding number and they're supposed to be um, touching each other. Here's another example. Cylinder number one has a one on the rod as well as a one on the cap. Same thing with cylinder number two. And cylinder number six has the cap on facing the right way, but the rod and the piston are 180 degrees off. Also, all of the pistons have this little divot on one side um, facing the front. You can see the backside does not have it. Same thing here, backside does not have it. But cylinder number six, I have it pointing backwards towards the back of the engine. As you can see, cylinder number five is pointing forwards. Very stupidly simple mistake that could have for sure ended this engine. And I know exactly how I made that mistake. I was struggling with the install of this piston, so I tried it like three or four times, and within the mix, I ended up flipping it 180 degrees, and of course, that's the one that successfully went in. But wiping away the oil at the bearing, we can see just how much it was struggling, how much it didn't like being 180 degrees off, because you can see how shiny it was right here, as well as right here. I'm damn near certain that that would have cooked our bearing. All right, we got it installed the right way now. Now let's redo our spin check. And <laughs> what do you know, now it spins freely. I mean, so far everything has looked fine. I don't see a reason why this engine would not run for a couple thousands. Guys, I just realized we hit 7,000 subscribers on YouTube. I just wanna say thank you to each and every one of you. I honestly find it crazy that we have that much support for a car that doesn't even run yet. So I know you guys are just as excited as I am to burn the rubber off of those tires. It is my goal before the end of the year to hit 10K on this channel. So if you're not already, hit subscribe. Anyway, our 302 short block is now assembled. We have our pistons, crank, and rods installed, which I would say is the hardest part of rebuilding any engine. Everything else comes pretty easy afterwards. So let's bag this bad boy up. Well, with our engine bagged up and our short block assembled, we are now out of time for this video. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you on the next one.